Good evening, friends. I'm so glad that you could join us for this uh, town hall meeting on a Tuesday evening. I'm glad you're taking time out of your day. I have a couple items that I want us to look at this evening, and I realize that some of you may have questions. There is a Q&A button down at the bottom part of your screen, and at any time during this town hall, you can type a question in there, and then uh, at the end of the town hall, I'll save some time to answer whatever questions that I'm able to answer. And uh, so again, all throughout the, our time together, if you think of something, just type it in there, and uh, we've got folks that are monitoring that and will watch, and, and I'll get to as many of those questions as I can or whatever I can at the end. I wanted to... Um, to share a scripture with you all in a word as we begin. This is from, uh, from Psalm 10. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand so far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked persecute the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes they have devised. For the wicked boast of the desires of their heart. Those greedy for gain curse and renounce the Lord. In the pride of their countenance, the wicked say, God will not seek it out. All their thoughts are, there is no God. Their ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of their sight. As for their foes, they scoff at them. They think in their heart, we shall not be moved. Throughout all the generations, we shall not meet adversity. Their mouths are filled with cursing and deceit and oppression, under their tongues are mischief and iniquity. They sit in ambush in the villages, in hiding places. They murder the innocent. Their eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. They lurk in a secret like a lion in its covert. They lurk that they may seize the poor. They seize the poor and drag them off in their net. They stoop, they crouch, and the helpless fall by their might. They think in their heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Rise up, O Lord. Lift up your hand. Do not forget the oppressed. Why do the wicked renounce God and say in their hearts, You will not call us to account? But you see, indeed you note trouble and grief, that you may take it into your hands. The helpless commit themselves to you. You have been the helper of the orphan. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoers. Seek out their wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations shall perish from this land. O Lord, you will hear the desire of the meek. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice for the orphan and the oppressed so that from the earth they may strike terror no more. I'm so struck by the first line of that psalm. Why do you stand so far away, Lord, hiding yourself in troubling times? I wonder if you've ever felt that way, if you've wanted to say those words to God. There have been times in my life when God seemed far off, out of touch, out of reach. And I've had sleepless nights and felt frustrated with prayer, like whatever I was saying was just bouncing off the walls. It's easy to feel that way in these days. As COVID numbers rise, as our political situation continues to be tumultuous, as our economy is a mess, we can't help but ask, why do you stand so far away, Lord, hiding yourself in troubling times? I mean, anybody who reads the Bible shouldn't be shocked by this psalm. To hear, to hear that confession of another or to feel it in our own soul. The Bible serves us well as a way to access God, as a source to bring God close to us, and really to bring us closer to God. But the Bible shares honestly that feeling of being far off from God or having God seem absent or silent or beyond our reach. In Psalm 10, uh, David expressed that feeling in words that resonate uh, the pain of his heart that pain of reaching for God and not feeling like we can make contact. And I think since we can identify with those feelings in that experience of knowing or feeling like God is far off, uh, we learn that we're not to be silent sufferers. Even though God may seem far off, even though a large question mark might be at the end of all of our prayers, still we tell God how we feel. God's absence is almost never felt when things are going great. 
uh, when the seas are smooth and, and the sky is bright, we just assume that God is right there taking care of us. But when the tensions in our life build up, when the frustrations mount, uh, let things get a little crazy and, and we begin to wonder, where is God? And I would say when that happens, do what David did. Tell God how you feel. I think that helps because it reminds us that, that God is near enough to hear even our complaints. Now, God may not have been doing all that David wanted. He may not be doing all that we want, but, but God is in within the reach of our prayers. We know this, and so we can raise those feelings to God. And, and when, when David does that, um, we find that he's unburdened and able to express his full trust in God. I mean, I think that's a great understanding of many of the Psalms is that in sharing honestly how we feel with God, we both unburden our own spirit and we express our trust in God as well. When we're able to express our feelings of, of fear or, or emotional or spiritual or whatever they might be, uh, if we don't express those, if we leave them bottled up, uh, they begin to show up in all sorts of other ways. Uh, they might break out as ulcers or stress or, or, or anger that does harm to others or loss of our faith that undermines our own healing. So sharing honestly our feelings with God is, is a dynamic that enables us to grow closer to God. And when we do that, uh, we're back at that needed place of trust. I mean, I think that's what the insistence of the psalmist is, that, that we're able to share honestly with God how we feel. I'm reminded of the words of Soren Kierkegaard when he wrote, The function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. The truth the psalmist would teach us is that we are to be strengthened in our faith, even when we feel like God is far off. I mean, listen again to verses 16 and 17. The Lord rules forever and always. The nations will vanish from this land. Lord, you listen to the desires of those who suffer. You steady their hearts. You listen closely to them. To establish justice for the orphan and the oppressed, so that people of the land will never again be terrified. So keep, keep that in mind, uh, knowing that this psalm is set in a, in a world uh, that's where they're complaining against the poor and the oppressed, the widowed and the orphan, where be, they were being used and exploited by sinful people. And for them, it seemed like God was nowhere to be found. But they, David knew better. And despite the fact that God seemed silent and removed, David knew that God was constant in love and care. I mean, that's God's character, and we know that God is changeless. And sooner or later, God will act. And you and I, we can count on that as well. I'm reminded of that old hymn, God will take care of you through every day or all the way. Our faith reminds us that, that God will strengthen our hearts even in the midst of these difficult days. That God continues to care for us. And that care is lived out in how we take care of others. I mean, that's our work as Christians. That's our work as the people of St. Paul's. And I thank you for your continued care and work. Amen. I did want to share some um, financial words with you tonight. Uh, I wanted to give you a snapshot of where we are financially. And, and this is going to be uh, not really a clear snapshot for a couple reasons. So I'll walk you through this. Um, the, the, the murkiness of this comes in that uh, we received a, a sizable gift from the Doug Kingsbury estate. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. So that when you add that money into our income, it skews the numbers. Secondly, the payroll protection plan from the CARES Act also throws our numbers off. St. Paul's Church and School, thanks to the hard work of Veronica Pierce, received $723,500 from the payroll protection plan. That covered the salaries of all of our staff as well as the preschool staff as well. So you can see that in our income as well and how that would skew the numbers. 
Also, uh, we sold our historic tax credits that we got as part of the Revive campaign. That was a $2.3 million uh, revenue for us, and you see that in the uh, year to dates as well. I want to say a word of thanks to Dave Morris and to Pre Preservation Houston and Hannah Curry for working with us to obtain those tax credits. And all of that money went to the Revive campaign, and in a moment we'll be talking about Revive, and you'll see where that money went into that as well. So our October year-to-date revenue is approximately $7.3 million, while our budget through October in normal years would have been about $3 million. So that extra revenue includes the Kingsbury estate money, the PPP money, and the tax credits as well. So our expenses through October, and you can see those in the bottom part of the chart, our expenses through October were just over $3.1 million. So our expenses are down some, but you can see on the chart as well that our giving is down about $95,000. In addition, our loose plate giving, that's the offering that people throw into the offering plate on Sunday mornings. Well, we haven't gathered on a Sunday morning for a while, and so that loose plate offering is down $30,000. Since we've not been able to have weddings, our wedding income is down about $44,000. You can see that in the chart. So financially, we might look like we're in pretty good shape, but that's because we've got that extraordinary money from the Kingsbury gift and from the PPP and from the tax credits as well. So what I would say to you is that, that um, if we're going to end this year in a positive financial place, uh, we're still depending on you all to help us finish out strong for the year. I have to tell you, I'm thankful for your generosity, your continued generosity during this time of COVID. Uh, your, your faithful giving so far is what has helped keep the ministry of this church going, and I'm thankful for that. As you can imagine, we are struggling to figure out what our 2021 budget will look like because we won't have that extraordinary money like we did in 2020. You may remember that on Sunday uh, I preached about uh, a par the parable of the talents. And, and you might be thinking, well, I wonder why uh, Jeff or Mary Linda, our director of stewardship, I wonder why they haven't sent out an estimate of giving card about stewardship. Well, the reason is, is we're waiting until Lent to do that stewardship campaign. And the reason is that that really fits the liturgical life of our church. Because Lent is a time when we Christians focus on simple living, on prayer, and on self-sacrifice, and, and how all those things help bring us closer to God. So Lent seems a more fitting time to do that, and it'll give us a better chance to develop what the 2021 budget will look like as well. I hope you'll be watching for uh, more information about the stewardship drive as it comes up. We'll also be offering some uh, financial classes in the first of the year to, to help people budget and get on track with those things. And so keep an eye out for those as well. I want to share with you too about a wonderful gift we got from Doug Kingsbury. Uh, the Kingsbury family has been around St. Paul's for many years. They joined back in the 50s. They had all sorts of leadership positions in the church. Uh, Warren Kingsbury served as chair of the administrative board, and the family was active in the church. Uh, Doug Kingsbury uh, died a little over a year ago, but his brother and sister, Bill and Jane, and all three of them grew up here in the church. Uh, Bill and Jane are still part of the St. Paul's family. I have to tell you, I never got to meet Doug, uh, but I feel like I've gotten to know him. Uh, Doug was an entrepreneur. He started a charter plane and helicopter business. He painted. He dabbled in recording music. He had this great collection of guitars. And he loved his dogs, Duke and Darla. And he made sure that in his death, Duke and Darla would be cared for. Now, you may be wondering how I know all this about Doug, who I never met before, but the reason is that Doug had the foresight to care and remember St. Paul's in his will. His careful planning set up the care of Duke and Darla, and now they have gone back to live a nice life with the breeder that Doug got them from. But St. Paul's received a wonderful gift in the amount of about $5.2 million from Doug's estate. Through the work of the Trustees and Finance Committee and the St. Paul's Foundation, 
Um, most of that gift has been allocated out already, so I wanted to go through this slide and tell you how we have done that. Uh, the first check that came to the church came in December of 2019 and was for $100,000. And that uh, went to the operating budget and helped us to end 2019 on the positive side of the balance sheet. The second distribution was in the amount of $3 million. One point six, just over $1.6 million went to the Revive campaign to pay off debt on that. And John Hawkins is going to tell us more about that. There was a tithe that went to missions that uh, we said that 10% of the money that we got from the Kingsbury estate would, be, would go to new mission projects, new hands-on relationship building mission projects for St. Paul's. There was a portion that we used for staff bonuses. Uh, our staff had not gotten a bonus in several years and has been working tirelessly during the COVID uh, to make all sorts of things happen up here. So we did a little bonus for all of the staff. Uh, part of it went to help pay our apportionments for the year. And then some different trustee accounts were set up. There was a Kingsbury Building Fund set up to help take care of our facilities through the years. There was a grant that was given to uh, when the organ in the sanctuary needs work, there'll be some seed money there for that and, and trustee money that's there. So you can see how that's all broken down. And uh, as uh, right now we've received about $5.2 million of that. And uh, there's still a little bit more out there and uh, we're working to finish up the estate, but uh, an amazing, amazing gift that Doug had the foresight to care for his church uh, after he had passed away. You know, I'm thankful for the trustees who are still working on this as the estate has not been closed out completely. I'm thankful to Beth Wiggins for helping to bring all this to our attention and to Kyle and Annalisa Frazier. I'm not sure Kyle and Annalisa knew uh, how much work was going to be involved when I asked them to help out with this and they agreed to do it. Uh, I'm sure that Doug's generosity will have a long lasting impact on his church and the future of St. Paul's. As I said, a portion of the Kingsbury estate went to the Revive campaign. And here's John Hawkins to catch us up on where we are with Revive. Good afternoon or evening, depending on which day you're watching this video. Uh, my name is John Hawkins, and I, along with my wife, Renee, and Ashley Ross, were chairs of the Revive Capital campaign that launched a couple of years ago in order to fund the major renovations that you've seen take place uh, at the church over the last couple of years. Uh, Reverend McDonald asked me to provide a financial update uh, on the project as well as the campaign. Uh, but before I do that, I want to uh, real quickly just go back and summarize you know, what the goals of the campaign were and the project and what we were trying to accomplish. The goals of the campaign were really threefold. Uh, first of all, we had needed to replace significant systems of the church, including the heating and air conditioning systems. Second, there were areas of the church that just really needed repair work, including the, the rusting of the casement windows, uh, the roofs leaking, the, the masonry along the, the walls uh, had some water infiltration. Uh, and finally, uh, there were areas of the church that really just needed renovation. Uh, and that included a total redo of the basement, which had been neglected for some time. Uh, as well as taking care of some accessibility issues in the plaza and some of our restrooms. So we were able to uh, address all those needs, uh, as you probably are aware of, through this project and through the campaign. So let's move to the financial update. Uh, now, if, if you look at the top section of, of the screen, uh, the construction costs, architecture, interest, and all the other ancillary costs that go along with a project like this totaled about $12.3 million. So that was our, our total spend. And funding of the project uh, came from various areas. First, the capital campaign, we raised uh, about $8.5 million in pledges so far. Uh, we had a goal of $10 million, so we came up a little bit short on that, but still, I think, a great accomplishment to have raised uh, the amount of money that we have. Uh, the second um, or historic building tax credits. And because we were renovating a historic building, we were able to get state tax credits that we could then sell to institutions in Texas to offset their franchise tax. And we were able to raise $2.3 million that way. And, and that was just an incredibly fortunate uh, situation for us because without those tax credit sales, we would likely have had to 
defer uh, some of the projects we were able to accomplish and it would have just been kicking the can down the road. Uh, and finally, as Reverend McDonald um, has told you about, there was a significant gift um, from the Kingsbury estate to the church and the trustees decided to allocate uh, almost $1.7 million of that gift to this campaign in order to really finish off the funding of it. And the next line on there, I put it on here, even though it's zero, because I think it's an incredible accomplishment that we did all this and we have zero permanent debt that we need to finance as a church in the coming years. So turning now to uh, the status of the pledges, uh, as I said, we, we have $8.5 million in pledges so far. Uh, we've collected 7.7 .7 million roughly of that. Uh, and uh, certainly hope to receive the rest of that uh, in, the, in the near future. And I would say, you know, I hope everyone you know, has, has pledged to this campaign, but if not, either because you're new to the church or your financial circumstances have changed, uh, or if you just feel compelled to give a little more than you gave uh, last time, uh, we would certainly love to continue to get some pledges in. And you know, while we do have it fully funded, we would love to be able to return some of that Kingsbury estate money to the trustees so they can set it aside for the future maintenance needs of the church so that we don't find ourselves in a similar situation later down the road. Uh, and finally, looking at the loan, while we don't have permanent debt, we did have to fund um, some of the construction costs to bridge the gap between when we had to pay for those and uh, receipt of pledges. So we have about $700,000 outstanding on that uh, short-term debt right now. Uh, that includes a little bit of money that's a final payment on the construction cost that'll be paid this week. Uh, but we'd love to get that $700,000 paid off uh, either by the end of the year or shortly into 2021. So I hope that this was a helpful overview for everyone to understand you know, where we are on uh, the project, on the financial aspects of the project, as well as the Revive Capital Campaign. Um, we certainly appreciate everyone's participation. Uh, and, and this is, again, I just think a tremendous accomplishment for the church to have been able to pull this off uh, over the last few years. And you know, I really hope that before too long, we'll all be able to see each other back at the church and really enjoy um, the, the fruits of, of what we've accomplished. Thank you very much. Just another word of thanks to uh John and Renee Hawkins and Ashley Ross for their work on chairing the campaign. And thanks to the building committee and all the hard work that they did. Um, I, you know, when I got here in July of 2019, there was scaffolding all over the place and not sure which doors you could go in and out or what, uh, where you could turn on water and electricity. And it was just kind of a crazy time. But uh, uh, the church looks amazing now. And so uh, as soon as we're able to regather, Again, uh, I think you'll be pleased with all the work that's been done and how good it looks. And so uh, speaking of regathering, um, I wanted to share some words with you all. We have a, a regathering committee task force that has met uh, throughout COVID and talked about how we work through these and the stages that we're in throughout this time. I want to tell you, too, that um, that we continue to watch uh, the number of rising cases uh, and, and that this regathering uh, plan that I will share with you, uh, you know, all that is keeping in mind and continuing to watch and knowing that uh, things may happen as numbers continue to rise. So uh, we do look forward to a different but certainly joyous Advent and Christmas. And I'm thankful to all of our staff and all of our volunteers who have been creative and flexible about how we might celebrate those things. There is a time for everything under the sun, a time to sow, a time to reap, a time for webinars, and a time to see your faces. I want to share about these Advent and Christmas opportunities uh, for this year. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you all get a little bit of sneak peek. All this won't be revealed. Now, the Sunday people got a little and you all get a little, but it really won't be out to everybody until the chimes on Thursday, but I wanted to give you all a chance to hear some of what's going on in the coming weeks uh, in terms of Advent and Christmas. Uh, I, I'm really excited to announce that um, this Advent will celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, both in person and on Zoom. We'll have an outdoor communion service on December the 6th at four o'clock in the plaza. 
It'll take place at the same time as our monthly Zoom communion does, uh, but we've worked, uh, worked thoroughly and, and um, diligently to prepare a meaningful worship service with as low a risk as possible. Uh, all of our worship and celebration will be masked, distance, and require the health screening to be signed down. They'll be outside. Um, you'll have to keep your mask on except for those five seconds when you receive communion. Uh, space will be limited. In fact, we have even changed that spacing. We had originally talked about six feet. We've moved that to eight feet. Uh, but but uh, we'll extend the table to as many people as are able. And uh, those of you who want to continue to join communion by Zoom are certainly welcome to do that as well. I know that uh, Advent and Christmas is an amazing time at St. Paul's and there's all sorts of activities that we do. So, so we're excited to invite you to an outdoor event that tries to capture the spirit of those most meaningful services. We're calling it Joy to the World, and it will be on December the 20th, and it will be a, a walk through the lessons and carols of Christmas. And small groups will be taken on a candlelit journey through eight different stations. Uh, each of them will depict a Christmas scripture lessons. Those uh, scriptures will be read. There'll be musicians and actors to kind of liven up the story. Uh, there are hundreds of spots available for that event. But again, people will be distanced and taken through on small groups. And it's spread throughout the day to allow that to be the safest possible. Uh, finally, we look forward to seeing you on Christmas Eve. You are invited to the plaza to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion throughout the morning and early afternoon. And I hope that will sort of um, uh, get you ready for candlelight services that night. We'll broadcast our candlelight services online uh, several times during the night on Christmas Eve so that you can be a part of that as well. Again, if you watch this week's chimes, you'll get more information and a link to sign up for all those activities as well. I have to tell you, even in the midst of all the COVID, uh, so many of our ministries have found flexible ways to meet. Our youth are having porch parties. There's a group tonight having prayer on the labyrinth. Uh, Sunday school classes are meeting by Zoom. Prayer groups are meeting outside. All kinds of things that are happening. But also, uh, we've seen um, the birth of some new ministries that have, are coming out of this. Uh, one of them is a community garden. And I'm, I'm glad that Helen Spa is going to share with you some words about the garden. Hi, my name is Helen Spa. I'm the Director of Special Programs here at St. Paul's. I'm happy to share with you today about our new community garden mission. Reverend Natalie Negrete first shared a dream of creating a community garden with me earlier this summer. The idea behind the St. Paul's community garden is for members of St. Paul's our Faye Esperanza community, and other gardening volunteers to work together to grow organic quality produce to share with families who need it and educate everyone in the process. Since then, staff and volunteers have been coming together with resources and gardening experience to make this mission possible. St. Paul School is sharing their garden area behind the Jones Building along Prospect Street to help create this dream. Reverend Paul Richards Kwan and the Missions Council approved our budget to get started. The community garden team began meeting, and we have been learning about and planning the garden with support from Urban Harvest. We're in the final planning stages. We have learned that the garden area is mostly shaded, and we have needed to adjust our plan for what we were able to grow there. We're looking to start small and expand when we are successful. We're planning to build and set up the beds by next month. We're looking to plant in January or February, depending on the recommended planting schedule. Herbs and any other plants will be sown, uh, sold on the plaza, and the proceeds will help our Faye Esperanza and Garden community members. Children, including students from our Rutabaga program, will be able to learn from the garden with guidance from one of our volunteers. Our long-term goals are to have an established garden and then expand the garden mission. In the future, there is potential to, for this garden to grow and expand into a partnership with a local restaurant, cooking opportunities, or selling herbs in a farmer's market with proceeds and beneficial experiences for our community garden members in need. We are now looking for volunteers who are interested in maintaining the garden and being a part of our garden community. 
Volunteers could be weekly, monthly, or for special events like our planting days. You do not need to have gardening experience to help. If you have a wheelbarrow we could borrow or any gardening supplies you don't need, please let us know. We have a monthly meeting by Zoom for anyone who is interested in volunteering as part of our community garden team. Our community garden reflects our St. Paul's mission to be a cathedral for Houston that embodies its diversity, inspires faith, and leads change for the common good of all peoples and communities. Through working together in this garden, this mission will connect communities, educate, inspire good stewardship practices for our earth, and create opportunities for those in need. Thank you. I'm really excited about that. Uh, this Sunday is gospel lesson on Christ the King Sunday um, are these kind of instructions about um, how we are to act uh, while we're waiting on Christ. And uh, Jesus tells a parable about sheep and goats and uh, how the sheep and goats would be separated and how we would know is uh, when we fed the hungry. And so certainly Helen's uh, and, the, and all the folks that are working on the garden have taken that to heart in, in, that, in doing that. Um, I wanted to uh, also just kind of remind you, if you have questions, you can turn those in during the any time during our visiting. And uh, then near the end, I'll try to answer them as best as possible. If you do, you can just uh, click on the Q&A spot down there. Uh, also, I know that um, I've, I've thrown a lot of facts and figures and numbers and things your way. And I, we're glad to send out like those October financial statements. If you're interested in budget things, you can always contact me or Veronica or Mary Linda and we can get that information out to you and get it sent to you. Uh, and you know, uh, in separating the sheep and the goats, it talks about feeding the hungry, but also talks about uh, caring for those who might be sick. And uh, another wonderful ministry that's going to get started here has to do with a partnership, a healthcare partnership between the University of Houston School of Nursing and St. Paul's. And Reverend Andrew Wolf is going to share a word about that. It is a joy and a privilege to speak to you as we recognize where St. Paul stands and celebrate where God is calling us. I am Reverend Andrew Wolf, and when I arrived here in the fall of 2017 as the pastor of Congregational Care, I quickly learned that the ministry of care doesn't just begin at the end of life. On August 25th, 2017, our home was flooded during Hurricane Harvey. We had spent the night at our neighbor's house, and the next morning Amanda and I waded over to see what was left. All we could see was three feet of water in our home and all of our furniture and belongings bobbing up and down in the water. We were devastated, and after composing ourselves, we found another way in, and the only thing that I could grab hold of in that moment, the only thing that was floating for me to grab on was this cross. It was a gift to us from our friends at my last church in Athens, Texas, and I clung to that cross not knowing what would come next. As we began to recover and settle into our jobs, I learned a lot of new things about being in Houston, but one of the most important things was realizing that congregational care doesn't start after the trip to the doctor or being called into a hospice care room. Care extends to every age and stage of our lives in celebrations and in grief, when we are healthy and strong and when we are fragile and frail. And so what I learned in the midst of Harvey and what I believe many of us are seeing now in the midst of this pandemic is how catastrophes can magnify inequalities and injustice in our society. In America, we spend more per person on health care than any other country in the world. We have a lower life expectancy, greater lags in childhood health, and we record more avoidable deaths than any other high income country. And all of this is because there is an unequal access to health care in our country. But it's not simply about seeing a doctor. It's about our housing and income, education, race, access to transportation, support systems, and even being connected to a community of faith. All of these factors influence the wellness of individuals and families. And so when major events like Hurricane Harvey or COVID-19 disrupt our society, they break open the wounds and show us reality that longs to be restored. Houston is a tale of two cities. We have the world's largest medical center with some of the brightest minds and cutting edge technology and creativity. 
But in the same city, there are those who live in wealthier zip codes who will live 10 years longer than those from poor zip codes. And for black women, their maternal mortality rate is twice of any other race. Some might see these wounds and look away, not knowing what to do or what to say. Others might write it off as a, a problem too big to solve. And yet for others, we see these realities and relish the opportunity to build up the kingdom of God. We see a new vision and we're called to dream dreams with God, to imagine the impossible me being made possible. St. Paul's, you are dreaming new dreams. You are seeing God's good future at hand. And for the last two years, I have been dreaming with the University of Houston's College of Nursing to imagine what it would look like for the church and for higher education to partner together and to bring health to the under and uninsured in our community. And so I'm excited to announce that in January of 2021, we'll be opening a brand new telemedicine clinic at Abraham Station to serve our community. This clinic will not only serve the health needs of the most vulnerable in our midst, but it will also provide training for future nurses. Dr. Shiny Verghese, Teresa McIntyre, and Kathleen Reeve will all oversee the clinic day to day and the students who are doing the practice of nursing right here at St. Paul's. We're also excited to have Dr. David Buck as our collaborating physician. Dr. Buck is one of the foremost experts on health care for the homeless in our country, and I'm proud to have him on our team. Together, this team, along with a board of advisors from St. Paul's and the EAC, will work to build a clinic that addresses chronic health issues and also provides preventative services like immunizations, screening, and referral for mental health services. Our goal is to open this clinic one day a week this spring and then to continually add days each following semester. And as we add days to the clinic, we will incorporate more health services through interprofessional education with the schools of medicine, optometry, social work, and pharmacology at UH. What I love about this model is how it cares for our community while also preparing future primary care providers to recognize and address the needs of disadvantaged populations. There is, of course, a role for you to play in all of this, too. The clinic needs compassionate and caring volunteers who will serve as receptionists for the clinic, as well as to offer prayer and spiritual care for these clients as they're waiting to see a doctor. And so I hope that if you see yourself in one of these roles, or if you have a curiosity about this project, that you would reach out to me directly. I am confident that this project will not only improve the health of our community, but that it will help St. Paul's to reimagine how we are called to live in a Christ uh, commandment to love our neighbors and to live into the teachings of Matthew 25. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you visited me. Thanks be to God for all that God is doing in the midst of this church and the seasons we have ahead. Amen. Thanks, Andrew. Lots of uh, exciting things still happening. Uh, we've had some uh, questions come in, and I'm going to try to answer those as I can. Uh, one of them had to do with worship numbers and, and um, where we were, our average worship attendance uh, prior to COVID, and kind of what it is now with people watching online. And I have to tell you, that's really hard to judge because um, we only know how many screens are logged on. And so, for instance, at my house, uh, Lene and I are both watching, but it only shows as one screen being logged on. However, I know in other people's houses, uh, there's some of the family might be watching in one room and some might be watching in another room. I do know that we have people worship with us regularly in France and in Japan and in Bolivia and all over the world. So uh, that's been pretty exciting as well. But I'm glad to try to work on some of those in, um, in the coming weeks in a pastor's message. I can get that out to you all and let you know um, where we are with what our membership looks like at this point and how many we have worshiping 
with us, what kind of our average worship attendance is. Uh, I can tell you too, we continue to take in new members. Uh, we've got uh, several families that are waiting for a Zoom meeting uh, when we'll bring them in as new members of the church. We've got a whole group of confirmation kids that are ready for us to be back in person and can get them confirmed as well. Uh, you may have noticed on Sunday mornings we've been recording baptizing babies and so that's been great. Uh, so the work of the church continues and we continue to uh, do all that we can even in the midst of these times. Okay, I, I feel kind of like I'm at the presidential debate or something because I've got these earbuds in and Mary Linda's in the back telling me the questions that you all are asking too. So uh, we're really high tech here. So, uh, But uh, they were asking about the, the long-term impacts of COVID, especially on our music ministry. And uh, I, I'm, I'm thankful to, uh, to Chris and to Anna and, and Dawn and, and uh, all of the music department and the, work, and, and the choral scholars, uh, the work that they've done, and um, our organ scholars, that they continue to try to produce music that we can use on Sunday mornings uh, in a worshipful way. Um, on, on Sunday morning when I was up here for a baptism, there was a quartet that was downstairs in the courtyard singing, and it was just beautiful to listen to them, and they were recording that. And so, uh, you know, we're, we are maintaining the highest quality of worship that we can and continue that. And uh, once COVID is over, we'll go back to uh, amazing, exceptional in-person worship with the music that you all are accustomed to as well. Any other questions, Mary Linda? Okay. So uh, again, if you, if, if you have a question about something and I didn't answer it uh, or something that you didn't want to answer in the Q&A or just want to talk about, please send me an email or call me. I'm glad to visit with you. All of our staff is open to that. And uh, if you have stewardship or financial questions, call Mary Linda or, or uh, Veronica. And, and we'll help you through those things. Always glad to visit and talk to people. Don't want to leave anybody out there guessing and wondering. I really am glad that you spent this time with us tonight, that you took this time out of your schedule and were a part of our meeting. You know, no uh, Methodist meeting can happen without, you know, it used to be without fried chicken or a casserole, but, uh, but we really can't happen without a hymn. So we're going to sing a hymn together. Uh, one of my favorite hymns, Be Thou My Vision. I'd invite you to uh, stand where you are or at your home and join us as we sing this wonderful hymn together.
And now would you receive this blessing? Now bear witness to the love of God in this world, so that to whom love is a stranger will find in you generous friends. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.